Hello to you quiet people, too. Hello to you quiet. <laughs> yes. I'm going to begin, I'm going to begin um, uh, in a way that I don't usually do. I'm going to begin actually reading a poem. And, um, you know, normally I don't do this, um, but I think this poem is so powerful uh, that I, it really needs to begin uh, today, the message for today. So calm yourself down, open your ears, and listen. It's called The Burnt Offering. It's by George MacDonald. Is there a man on earth who every night, when the day has exhausted each strong limb, lays upon his bed in chamber dim, and his heart straight away trembling with delight, begins to burn up toward the vaulted height of the great peace that overshadows him. Like flakes of fire, his thoughts within him swim till all his soul is radiant, blazing bright. The great earth under him an altar is upon whose top a sacrifice he lies, burning to God up through the nightly skies, whose love warm brooding over him kindled his, until his flaming thoughts consumed expire, sleeping ashes covering the yet glowing fire. As I said, I don't normally begin this way, but I think it's appropriate today because what George McDonald is describing dramatically, poetically, is the act of being on fire for God, being on fire for him. You've been around church people enough, you probably come across that phrase, right? Being on fire for God, the desire to be on fire for him. Sometimes, you know, you'll hear stories of somebody goes on a, on a trip, a ministry, a missions trip, or a convention, or retreat, and they come back, and they're on fire. Mm -hmm. They hear a message, and it makes them go on fire for the Lord, be on fire for the Lord, become on fire. Right? This is not a fancy way of talking about emotions. Emotions come and go. Emotions usually last a few seconds or a few minutes. Sometimes they can last a couple of hours. Okay, But they're always replaced really quickly with some other emotion. What we're talking about here is something deeper. It's something that can endure, can endure for days or months, maybe even years. It's a sense that we have that we're more clear about who we are. We're more clear about our life because we see everything in some way as coming from God and coming back to him. So, so everything has significance beyond just what you can see with your eyes or hear with your ears. And you find that your life has a deeper purpose and your desires have changed. No longer do you just want to live for those empty worldly pleasures. You want your life to be something more. You want it to be an offering up to God. Everything gets its joy and its significance because you see it in light of God. This is what it means to be on fire. Does anybody know this experience being on fire for God, on fire, on fire? You know, there's, there's one of our elders here he had an encounter in his life, an encounter with God. It began to change his whole life around. It changed how he approached his work. It changed how he approached his marriage. It changed how he approached his family. He saw, began to see everything through the Spirit, and he desired more. He desired that his life would be more on fire. And he confided in me that he began to go to talk to other people to figure out how his life, how he could burn even more. And he went to these people that he thought were mature Christians, and what they told him was, this happens sometimes. It's passing. Give it some time, and you'll settle down, and everything will go back to the way that it was. That's tragic, isn't it? 
It's tragic. We weren't meant to live like that. We were meant to have a little flame erupt in our heart only to burn out and to live life just as we always did. God has called us to live on fire. More and more and more of us consumed. More and more of us. More of our heart. More of our thoughts. More of our life. More of our actions. Burning brightly for Him. To the day comes when we are all flame for Him. All flame. Trouble is, it's, 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 it's more difficult than that, isn't it? Right? The fire that kindles, the spiritual fire in our heart, the fire for our Lord, it seems to burn bright and then dies down and burns up again and dies down. For some of us here, the experience of being on fire is maybe only just a hope that we've had. One day, my life would be on fire. I would be on fire. Some of us, it might be just like a distant memory. I remember back when, <laughs> when I was on fire. And I'm telling you, you were meant to live that way. I wasn't meant to live that way. But how? This is the question. How can we burn? How can we burn more brightly? I think the answer, I know actually, the answer is found in Scripture. There is an answer to this question. And it's actually, the answer is hidden in the stories of the altars of Scripture. We've been exploring the altars of Scripture the last three weeks. That passage of Scripture where the, where the Lord says, build an altar of earth to me. And the last few weeks, we've been focusing on building the altar, building it up. The altar as we build it, the altar itself is meant to be a monument, a reminder of what God has done in the past and what God will do in the future. It's to convict us. It's to point the way forward for us. It's to help us to keep from getting lost, the altar itself. But the altar ultimately is only significant for what happens on it. We are to build an altar and rebuild the altar so that we can do something there. The altar itself is just a place. It's what happens on the altar that matters. And what happens on the altar? On the altar of God, we meet him. He meets us. And we share life together. Altars are places of encounter between God and us. But if you look at Scripture, what you'll find, if you study the altars of Scripture, that our encounter with God, even though every person encounters God a little differently, you know, there's always this pattern. From beginning to end, there's a pattern. And the pattern looks like this. The people return time after time to the altar, and they offer something to God. They offer a sacrifice to God. That's what they bring. And when they, alter, when they offer the sacrifice upon the altar, God meets them by bringing the fire. We bring the sacrifice. God brings the fire. You see this all the way from the very beginning. Altars show up really early in the story of God and God's people. Actually, the children of Eve and Adam begins there. We have a sacrifice. Cain and Abel, it goes badly. <laughs> but that's the first sacrifice that's given. And if you notice from that story on, every story what we find is the people of God bring a sacrifice. But nowhere in Scripture does it say they bring the fire. They bring the sacrifice. God brings the fire. And the reason for this is it has everything to do with what Randy was saying during the communion meditation. Fire in scriptures always represents the presence, the life of God. From the burning bush to the flames on top of Mount Sinai to the fiery pillar that leads the Israel through the wilderness to the fire that rains down from heaven. It's always an image of the presence of God, fire. And we find this pattern. The people of God come to the altar. They bring their sacrifice. God brings the flame. And something wonderful happens there. 
the sacrifice and the flame become one. And again, as Randy said, everything that is impure gets consumed, burned away, and what is of value is purified. And it ascends up to God as something beautiful, beautiful aroma. What's interesting about this, this these encounters, these, these sacrifices that are given on the altar, they're so important that when, when, when the Lord gives Moses the commandment, the teaching, the Torah, to rule the people of Israel, show them how to live their life together, he, he commissioned a whole tribe, a whole family, to serve as guardians of these altars. This tribe is called the, the Levites, sons of Aaron. They were the priestly tribe. And their job was to be guardians of the altars. The reason why is because the altar is so important, because it's the place where the people meet their God, and God meets the people. And these Levites, these, these priestly figures, their job is to serve that encounter, to serve God and to serve his people. And they would do it this way. They would serve the people because what the people would bring is some sacrifice, some offering, something that's costly, something that means something to them. And the reason why they would do that is because they want to demonstrate their devotion to God. You mean something to me. You're costly. You're more valuable than all these things in my life. So I'm going to take something costly, something valuable, and I'm going to just give it away. In fact, I'm going to just burn it up for you because you mean so much more than this stuff. And the priests would serve the people by helping them with that. They would make sure that nothing defiled or ugly or impure or lacking value, no trash would be thrown on the altar. That whatever is given is given as, as something pure and holy, as Scripture says, acceptable and holy to God. So they would serve God's people that way by helping them bring an offering that was holy and good and of great value. And the Levites would also serve God. And the reason how they, was, how they would serve God is by tending the flame of the altar. What's wonderful about this is if you look in the book of Leviticus, you'll find all kinds of important significance to how they would bring the sacrifice and how they would keep the flame. Now, I don't know, have you guys ever tried to read Leviticus? Some of you? You're like, I'm going to do this. And then you get like a couple of pages in, you're like, I can't do this, right? It's hard. It's hard. One of the reasons why it's hard, though, is we don't, we, we don't have the proper lens to read it. If we have the proper lens, if we're seeing things properly, it opens itself up to us in so many ways. It reveals so many wonderful mysteries about our life in Christ. Some of those mysteries are this. The priests, those that are to serve God's people, there's so much attention given on what the sacrifice is that we are to bring. There's almost no attention at all given to what the flame should look like. And the reason why is this, because the sacrifice is what we bring. It's the flame that God brings. So we have this attention given. And what's wonderful about it is you'll find, for example, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to go ahead and read some of these things. There's wonderful things in here. Leviticus 6:12. Look at this. The priests are never to light the fire. They are never to bring the flame. The flame is always already there. The fire on the altar shall be kept burning on it. It shall not be put out. This is the commandment of the Lord. This is the sign of my presence. You're not going to bring my presence. My presence is already there. This is a sign. This is a symbol that I am with you. 
The priest shall burn wood on it every morning and lay the burnt offering in order on it. And he shall burn on it the fat and the peace offerings. There's so much to this. We cannot get into it today, but I'd love to talk to you about it sometime. We're going to have a sermon series on the fat of the altar. Doesn't that sound good? What do you think? Yeah. A fire shall always be burning on the altar. It shall never go out. You see? The people bring the sacrifice. The priests bring the wood. They're the helpers. God brings the flame. God brings the fire. And sometimes we even find in Scripture that the offering that's given, the sacrifice that's given, is so, it's, it's so valuable, it's so costly, it's so, it's so pure that the Lord responds in, I mean, dramatic fashion. The fire actually burns out from the inside of the temple and just consumes the sacrifice. We see this, for example, in Leviticus chapter 9. Then Aaron, this is at the first time, right? He lifts up, Aaron lifts his hand toward the people and he blessed them. And he came down from the offering, the sin offering, the burnt offering, the peace offering. And Moses and Aaron went into the tabernacle of meeting, that is in the Holy of Holies, the holy place. And then they came out and blessed the people. This is the middle of this offering that they give, this sacrifice that they give. And it says, then the glory of the Lord appeared to all the people. And how did it appear? Fire came out from before the Lord and consumed the burnt offering and the fat on the altar. When all the people saw it, they shouted and fell on their faces. The fire is a sign of God's passion, his zeal, his love, the consuming fire. Now, what do we have to learn from all of it? I think there is profoundly important wisdom here. And that it is this. For those of you who seek to burn, for those of you who wish to be on fire, for those of you who desire that the fire in your heart would grow. Now, I know that that's not all of us are there today. Some of us don't desire that at all. Our desires are just firmly fixed on the things of the earth, the things that you can see and touch, the things that will last you 60 years. But some of us are here today. Some of us desire to burn with the Spirit, to have a life that is on fire for the Lord. And I'm telling you this, if you desire that, what this is teaching you is this. Do not worry about the fire. Worry about the sacrifice. Do not ask yourself, how can I burn more brightly for the Lord? Ask yourself, what do I have to offer to him? Because you are to meet God by offering the sacrifice. He offers the fire. You see? You offer the sacrifice. He offers the fire. Now, there's so much that we could, we, could, we could explore in the book of Leviticus about what this offering should be. What is, what is a holy and acceptable offering to the Lord? I just want to focus on one of those things today, something that we see from the very beginning of the book of Leviticus, chapter 1, and that is this, that a holy and acceptable sacrifice to our God is a costly sacrifice. It costs us something. We see this from the very beginning. In Leviticus chapter 1, the Lord says, if you choose to bring an altar, not, I mean offering, if you choose to bring a sacrifice to me, again, this isn't mandated. and Not everybody has to do it. But if you desire to bring an offering to me, he says, let it be this. Let it be a bull from your livestock that is without blemish, that isn't lame, that isn't weak, that isn't sick. Let it be the firstborn from your cattle. Now, what's the big deal? Well, that's the most costly animal that you could give. It's the most cost, honestly, and animals were the most costly thing you could own. So what the Lord says, if you're gonna bring me a gift, Make it something costly. Now, from that point, if you read on through chapter one, you'll see he goes down and he says, 
He says, but you could also bring this. He says, you bring a bull, but if you can't, he says, bring a goat or bring a sheep. And if you can't do that, bring a bird, bring a pigeon. And if you can't do that, just bring grain, bring bread and offer it to me. Now, the point is with this is he starts with the, he starts by saying, you want to give something to me, give me the greatest. Give me the greatest thing that you can give. Now, if you cannot do that, if, you, if your heart is too weak, if your faith is too small, then give me this and give me this and give me this all the way down to the littlest offering that you can give. And I will accept that. And I think there's, there's so much wisdom here, you see. The Lord doesn't start off by saying, hey, you can, you, when you come give me something, I'm satisfied with this. And if you want to give more, that's great. No. He says, if you're going to give an offering to me, if you want to burn, if you want to be on fire, it gives me something great. Give me the greatest thing that you can give. Now, is that because he only accepts the greatest and everything else is worthless? No. He delights in the smallest gifts we give, but he's only satisfied with the greatest. I want to clarify this. Okay, I want to clarify this. He delights in the littlest of our sacrifices, but he's only satisfied with our greatest. And he does that because he's a good father. I want to give you an example. When, when my, when my, I remember the very first time that my son learned to walk. I remember those first few steps that he made, and I delighted in those steps. Do you all remember that, mothers, fathers? You delight in those first steps. Do you remember the first few words, just one little word, one little phrase, mama, dada, right? You delight in those things. Do you follow me? But no good father or mother is satisfied with that. No one says, that's it, job well done, I'm on my way. The heart of a good father, the heart of a good mother is to only be satisfied when the child can talk and walk and run and climb and be everything that that child can be. You see what I'm saying? We don't give up until they've reached the fullness of the maturity of what they could be. We're not satisfied until they are everything that they can be. And that's love. You see what I'm trying to say? So the Lord delights in the little If all we can give is a little, he delights in it, but his desire is for everything. This is why Jesus again and again and again, I mean, he's pleased with a little thing. Do you have just the faith of a mustard seed? With a woman who just gave two pennies. Just believe a little bit. Just sacrifice a little bit. He delights in those things, but at the same time, he says what? You have to give it all. That's my ultimate desire. It's not going to be satisfied until you give all of yourself. That's why he says all these hard things in Scripture. Like whoever loses their life for my sake will save it. If you seek to save your life, you'll lose it. Whoever, Whoever loses husband or wife or family or job or lands for my sake will gain it back again. You must give it all to me. Now, why? Why would the Lord desire all and not just some? It's because of this. It's an important, important spiritual truth. It's only what you sacrifice to him that he can set on fire. I want to say that again. It's only what you sacrifice to him, that you give over to him, it's only that that he can set on fire. Sacrifice nothing and you don't burn. Sacrifice a little, you burn a little. Sacrifice all you become all flame, you see, all flame. And as Jesus says, he take, he, everything that you give to him, he gives back to you. 
on the fire. Let me see. On fire. You guys know this from your own experience. You know this truth from your own experience, even in your relationships with one another, you know? Boyfriend, girlfriend, fiancés, husband and wife. Let me tell you this. You want your marriage to really burn. You want your relationship with your wife to be on fire. This is what you guys need to do. Every time you go on a date, every time you have, uh, you know, you on your anniversary, you take your spouse out, take them to McDonald's. Subway, Taco Bell. When, when you decide to buy them jewelry, you know, to show them that you love them, go, go to, you know, and it's usually in front of those Mexican restaurants. You put the quarters in and you get those little plastic rings and stuff. Do that. I'm telling you, your, 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 your relationship is going to be on fire. Well, it will be on fire in a different way, right? Why? Why? Because you're worth, yeah, exactly, because they're worth more than that. And you want to communicate that. You are of great value. You have great worth to me. And so I'm not going to cheap out on you. You see, you're worth more than my money. That's why I'm going to buy you that ring. That's why I'm going to buy you those earrings. That's why I'm going to take you to a nice restaurant. Because you're worth that much. And when you give something that's costly that way, you understand that the flame begins to burn, you see, more brightly. And it's not just monetary things. Sacrifice greatly for your spouse. And you'll find that the flame comes bright again. Sacrifice your time for them. Listen to them. Show them that they're valuable. Show them that they're worth your time and your attention and your heart. And what happens? Your relationship turns on fire. And you're wondering, man, you know, you know that song, you've lost that love and feeling, you're right? You're worried about your love and feeling. Don't worry about the love and feeling. Offer the sacrifice and let the fire come. And it's the same truth with God. The same truth with God. You give a little, you burn a little. You give it all, you burn. You come on fire for him. You want to be a living flame? Don't worry about the fire. Worry about what you have to give. And make that gift something that worth something to you. Make it a costly gift. I asked you to uh, no, I'm gonna say this. I'm gonna say this. I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna end with two things. The first is a word of just praise to Christ. Because I don't I don't know if you've recognized this, I know some of you have, but this is all Jesus from beginning to end. <laughs> Why did Jesus burn so brightly? Because every thought and every word, every day, every moment was an offering to his father out of love. He says, I say nothing of myself. It's all from my father. And it's all for my father. You see, he wasn't worried about burning brightly. He was just worried about offering his sacrifice to his father. And so he burned. And when he went to the cross, which is the great altar, he offered himself to the Father. Do you remember, do you remember what I said about those priests, those Levites? They served God and they served the people. Jesus, I mean, this is Jesus, right? Our brother takes our less than holy and acceptable sacrifice and makes it holy and acceptable unto the Father. You see? He serves us at the altar of the cross by taking what is less than glorious and making it glorious for the Father. And that's not it. You see, our Lord Jesus, he served the Father because upon offering, that, that offering to the Lord, 
It says in the Gospels, and then he breathed out the Spirit. It's through Jesus that God the Father's flame, his Holy Spirit comes upon us. Do you see? Our brother Jesus serves us, and he serves the Father. He provides the perfect sacrifice and breathes out the holy flame. Praise to you, Lord Jesus. Praise to you for taking everything that is less and making it pure and holy and acceptable. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for, for being the one through which your fire would come upon your people. Amen. And finally, I want to ask you this. You have a stone in your hand. Each week, that stone means something different. We've been building, and now we're going to burn. My question to you is that that stone represents something that you can sacrifice, something that you can offer. What will that be? What will it be? I want you to think about this. The Lord asks for a costly gift. Not because he needs it, not because he does want, he wants to deprive you of something, but because he wants to give something greater back to you. You see, something on fire. Now, some of us, that costly gift, you know, some of us, it's time. That's, that's what we feel throughout the day we have the least amount of, right? We try to protect it and hoard it and keep it. It doesn't seem like there's enough of it. And that our time has so much value to us. If that's you, that might be your costly gift. You're going to give up some time. You're going to mark your calendar. You're going to put an alarm on your phone and you're going to say, these five minutes, these, this hour, it's for you. Every day, I'm going to give you my time. Some of you, you know, it, it might be something like this. It's pride. So, for example, you know, you've been, you've been at odds with someone in your life for quite some time because they wronged you, and you are certain that it's they're at fault for it. They're the one with the problem. For all purposes, you're right. It's them. But what are you what are you holding on to by not seeking to be reconciled with them? Something of great value to you. Your innocence, your dignity, your ego, your sense of I was the one in the wrong. Maybe that's really valuable to you. Maybe that really that's really important thing for you. And my question for you is, is maybe it's time for you to sacrifice that. That's your costly gift. You know, for some of us, it's, it's, our, it's our wallets. It's our resources. I'm not telling you that because I want you to give money to the church. I, you, I'm not talking about that at all. Give it to somebody else. Give it to something else. My point is, is if that's the costly gift and you want to burn, you want to be on fire, then worry about the sacrifice. Let him set you on fire. I believe that each and every one of us today has something, a little thing or a great thing that we have to give. And I'm, I'm, I, I, want you, I want you to understand that when we give this, we're not deprived. We are blessed because he gives it back. A hundredfold, he says. Allow him to set you on fire. Take a little thing. Take a great thing say, Lord, this is mine and I'm giving it to you. It's not mine anymore.
I want, I want, I want to ask this Holy Spirit to open your mind and your heart to reveal to you in some way what that is. Maybe some of you already know what that is. You're clear and you're ready to go. Some of you here might not know what that is. And so I'm going to ask right now the Holy Spirit to give us some wisdom and discernment. So let's go ahead and get quiet. Let's hold that stone in our hand. Let's go into a posture of prayer. And I'm going to pray for you. I'm going to pray, Holy Spirit, that you would enlighten the mind of every person in this room to reveal to us what it is that you want us to give. Lord, we know that that can be, that can be all kinds of things. If we cling to, uh, you know, we're so worried about our children. And we cling to them day in and day out. Worry, 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 worry. Maybe that's what we have to give over to you. Maybe it's our aspirations with our careers could be a million different things but lord i want i'm i'm going to ask you right now lord jesus lord please show each heart in here what it is that you would have them give in these next few moments just lord just show them Now, Lord, give us the strength to offer it up. Give us the strength to offer it over, to surrender it to you, Lord Jesus. In the name of Jesus, amen. A few more words for you, okay? If nothing came to you, then you've been given a gift. The gift is to pursue the answer to that question today and the days to come. You follow me here? Pursue the answer to that question. Because often when the Lord has something not doesn't reveal it to you right away, it's later on that you get the real answer if you keep pushing. So I'm going to say, if he didn't reveal it to you yet, pursue it. The second thing I want to say is I'm going to invite all of you to come forward in this time of prayer and to worship and to lay that thing down before the Lord. Now, I'm asking you this. If you're ready to lay it down, if you're ready to sacrifice it, take that stone and put it on this altar. But if you're not ready, if you're struggling, if you say, Lord, I want to give this up, but I can't. I can't right now. It's too hard. It's too costly for me. Then I want you to take that stone. Go ahead and come forward. Take that stone. Put it in your pocket. And I want you to carry it with you the next few days. Hold on to that stone. Pray about that stone. Think about that stone. Think about that thing and say, Lord, show me what I'm to do with this. Show me how I'm to release this. I know, I, I know that you're calling me to release, but I don't know how. And keep it with you as a reminder. If you don't put that stone on, that, on this altar, you're no less than the people that do. If you're the one that carries that stone with you in the days to come, praying over that stone, that's exactly what you need to do. If you're not sure what it is, you pursue the sacrifice. That's what it, you're called to do. Each one of us, though, I believe down to the depths of my heart, each one of us is called. Called to pursue giving our lives as an offering to him. So let's take that time right now. We got time for worship. We got time for prayer. Don't follow the crowd. Don't follow the leader. You follow Christ. You follow the movement of the Spirit. And if he calls you to come up here, if you feel led to come up here, place the stone here. If you feel led to keep that stone in your pocket, do that. But do it for him. Make it a gift to him. Make it an offering of praise to him. Lord Jesus, I pray that you are glorified by what we have to bring. And I, I pray, though, that we meet you on this altar. And I pray that we glow hot with the fire that comes from your spirit. And you consume everything that is impure within us, Lord. And you purify everything that has value. Make our lives, Lord, an offering to you. Lord, lead us to that place we know one day we will be. And we are all aflame for you. In the name of
name of our Lord Jesus, we pray. Can I get an amen?